Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PackUp's Recyclable Packaging Innovations uh, webinar. Very good to have you here today. Uh, my name is Paul Jenkins, uh, Managing Director of UK Packaging Innovation Consultancy, the PackUp. Uh, also joined today by uh, our Technical Director, Barrington Pamplin, who will be sharing the questions later, and Justin Kempson from uh, Charpack. Do you want to say a few words at this, sec at this moment, uh, Justin? No, just I'm. I'm uh, I've just been looking at the participants. I recognise some names, so thank you because um, you obviously know me, and um, and you still come onto the webinar. So thank you very much. And they know me as well, so that's a double double whammy in our favour. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn my camera off because I think uh, people don't need to see me when uh, they rather hear what I've got to say than look at me. Um, so yeah, so we've got a presentation from uh, Justin coming up. Uh, what we'll be covering over the next 55 minutes or so is the following. So uh, we have um, 60 seconds uh, on the pack up and our innovation zone. Uh, we're then going to look at um, some new recyclable packaging innovations in two sections. So the first section uh, precedes uh, Justin's presentation. Um, and Justin will do his bit on uh, how his company is uh, helping the, um, the the plight of uh, improving recycle recyclability in, in plastic. Uh, that we'll then do a um, another set of innovations from our innovation zone database. Uh, then focus on, on details of, of our next event. Uh, we're going to try something a bit different for this event for the first time. After the um, after the webinar, there will be an opportunity to have a, a post event breakout room. Um, so if uh, you would like to attend that breakout room uh, to have a chance to speak to Justin in a more informal manner uh, post event, uh, please email paul at thepackup.com and we'll send you a link for access uh, at the end of the event, uh, just around about four o'clock. Um, so make sure you get your questions in. There's a panel at the bottom for Q&A. So we'd like to get as many questions from you as possible and Justin will be delighted to answer them towards the end of the webinar. And you will get a link to this webinar recording post event, uh, so that uh, will, and it will also be available uh, on YouTube. And actually, you can follow the pack up at youtube.com forward slash pack up for all our uh, video content. So, 60 seconds or so on the pack up. Uh, apologies for those of you that have um, sat through nine, 10, or 11 of our webinars, you would have heard this once or twice before. Uh, four areas of, 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 of products, um, technical support and project management. So uh, Barry and his team can help uh, packaging companies, retailers, suppliers, anyone really with their packaging projects, um, that will be a, a half day uh, input or a three, six, nine month project, depending on the requirements. Uh, we do events and obviously webinars. Um, we're looking to get back face to face as soon as we can um, but may not be until uh, early 2022 with how things are looking to be panning out. Uh, we also do reports, our last one was on refillable and reusable packaging compendium and we're just about uh, finished our global packaging trends uh, report uh, which is almost out now uh, and will be available uh, covering the 10 latest packaging innovation trends. And finally, our Innovation Zone Packaging Database. So this is a, a global uh, resource, it's searchable and easy to use. We now have over 4,500 packaging initiatives, 20 new innovations uploaded each week from concept to market launch. Very much a global view. We, we use, uh, we track uh, packaging across 15 different languages. Um, it's a great way to keep uh, teams up to speed and create those next good ideas as well as keeping up um, with what your competition are doing. So a number of um, members uh, already uh, signed up. So if you're interested in knowing more, then please contact me. So right, on to some recyclable packaging trends. Um, many new initiatives coming to market. This was a, a, a home banker really in terms of um, innovations to, to, to look at. Uh, recyclability and recycled content is one of seven of the sustainable packaging trends that we, we, we uh, cover on a regular basis. Um, this, is around, this is about recycled content as well as improved recyclability. 
you know, we've had uh, plastic packs being introduced around the world. I think Canada was the latest uh, market to go down that way. Uh, we've had the UK plastic pack now for two and a half years or so. Um, and the emphasis is very much uh, on 100% recyclable, reusable or compostable packaging by 2025. And when that was announced, that seemed like a long time away, but 2025 is uh, getting ever so close now. Um, and really, you know, reusable packaging is growing, compostable packaging is kind of growing, but the real effort is of those three is, is in recyclability, hence the, the amount of activity uh, we are seeing of late. Uh, you've also got things like plastic taxes around the world, and the UK one will see 30% uh, payment for, it, for packaging that has less than 30% recycled content. So that's obviously influencing change. Um, we're also seeing developments in, in recycled uh, plastic, so obviously uh, recycled PET is, is well established, but we're seeing developments for recycled polystyrene and polypropylene coming to our attention. There's lots of 100% um, you know, recyclable language we're, we're, we're spotting, um, despite products not being recyclable everywhere. Um, lots of monomaterial developments. Um, is some, some people claiming to be uh, recycle ready as a way of uh, preparing uh, the systems to, to, be, to be recyclable without actually necessarily having the, the systems in place to, to be recycled um, at, that, at the current time. So that's sort of a very brief overview of, of where we are in terms of recyclable packaging trends. Um, and without further ado, well, let's look at some, some examples. As always, uh, you know, we're picking out uh, innovations that have come to market. So th these aren't the best innovations. Uh, they're not the worst innovations. They are a reflection of what we're seeing uh, coming to our attention. Um, sustainability it can be subjective. Um, you may not agree with every initiative is the right thing for that product to do. Um, but it, it's, it's our job really just to inform you with what is uh, what is going on in, in the market. So first up is Flexible Packaging Converter Specialist pro -Ampac, who have uh, uncovered a new patent pending solution aimed at improving recycling of retort pouches. Their proactive recycle ready retort RT3000 is suitable for the safe protection of food and pet care products. And the pouches are available in both stand-up and three-side seal configurations. The RT3000 is a recycle-ready monomaterial uh, format and has been designed to run at similar filling speeds to current non-recyclable multi-material structures. It is available in clear or opaque options and offers the necessary stiffness for stand-up shelf performance. Um, safe distribution is enabled through its high puncture and uh, flex crack resistance. Um, it is able to withstand retort uh, conditions of 130 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and the solution answers the growing desire from brands for re recycle ready, uh, that's that expression used, uh, retort packaging, and is both EU and FDA compliance for food contact, as you would expect. So we're seeing a lot of monomaterial developments, and uh, that is a good example. Now, Kraft Heinz uh, has announced that it will be removing the shrink wrapping for its uh, multi-pack can range for the UK market. Uh, the material will be swapped for a sustainably certified paperboard in a move in line with the company's goal to make their packaging recyclable, reusable, or compatible, or compostable uh, by 2025 in line with the UK Plastic Pact. Uh, the change is reported to reduce the plastics, plastic footprint by 550 tonnes. Uh, and the new sleeve is fully recyclable and uh, uses 50% less material than a fully enclosed container, as well as 10% uh, less than traditional paper board sleeves. Now we posted this on, on our company page on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago and probably had about 200 comments uh, from various uh, people, either very positive about this as a, as a change uh, or quite negative about this as a, as a change. So as I said, um, uh, sustainability is, uh, is is in the eye of the beholder to a, a, a large extent. But what we are seeing is um, much more supporting evidence of, of, of the change. So, for example, Hindstate 
that the new sleeves deliver an 18.7% carbon footprint reduction compared to the shrink wrap equivalents uh, they replaced. And this isn't uh, you know, a, a small change. Kraft Heinz is making a, a 25 million pound investment over three years to make the infrastructural changes uh, necessary to ensure uh, a smooth rollout. Now, I don't know whether the days of this, the plastic shrink wrap are, are numbered, but we're certainly seeing a number of different new innovations uh, in this space to replace plastic with other materials. VPK Group uh, is a, a founding member of the Pan-European Blue Box Partners Alliance. There's four current members um, of family-run corrugated cardboard packaging sector businesses. Um, VP K Group is, is a Belgian-based outfit and has launched a corrugated alternative to shrink wrap uh, for the multi-packing of a wide range of bottles. Their new EcoGrip solution has been designed to replace single-use shrink wrap plastic for bottles from sizes 330 ml through to one and a half liters and is adaptable for uh, a variety of different bottle styles regardless uh, of diameter for four, six or eight bottles. Um, it delivers a recyclable, a biodegradable, corrugated corrugate alternative. Um, and, and they've also considered the ergonomic design to make it easy for consumers to both handle and store. And of course, options for printing uh, on, on that as well for, for various branding opportunities. Now we're seeing a lot of recyclable paper-based uh, packaging in the sort of confectionery space. Um, and Unilever um, is another business working towards this 100% sustainable, 100% uh, reusable, recyclable, compostable packaging by uh, 2025. And they're also looking to halve the, their use of virgin plastic in that time. So as part of this vision, uh, the Ben & Jerry's ice cream brand is set to undergo uh, a bit of a packaging overhaul, uh, a new on stick version of Ben & Jerry's uh, cookie dough, sounds very delicious, is being introduced to facilitate eating on the go. The ice cream variant is being sold uh, in a new recyclable paper-based wrapper format as a replacement for um, uh, a, a, a plastic-based uh, format. Unilever describes the pack as a uh, first of its kind uh, tie-dye wrapper. Um, the wrapper is made with 88% paper and is reported to be widely recyclable. Next up, uh, another one from Pro Ampac, who have, Pro Ampac, who have announced the introduction of a high barrier snack packaging uh, for the uh, Ocean Spray brand. Uh, the premium snack packaging has been designed to be easy to recycle. Um, Ocean Spray's uh, fruit and nut snack mix will use the recyclable R1000 film from Pro Ampac. The solution is designed to be heat resistant and features a proprietary sealant technology. It is suitable for high speed, vertical and horizontal form fill seal uh, applications and is reported to perform better than many comparable typical recyclable mono material films. The film offers a high performance recyclable alternative to many conventional film laminations and is available in either standard or high barrier versions. The film is actually reported to run faster than typical mono materials currently on the market. Now, I mentioned confectionery paper-based initiatives and here's another one uh, out announced over the last couple of days or so. Um, Mars Wrigley, again, move, working towards this uh, plastic packed initiative um, uh, for 2025. Uh, coupled with um, the aim to reduce the consumption of new plastic by uh, 25%. Um, they are introducing a paper-based pack for their Ballista chocolate bar for the German market. Um, and for the first time, Mars Ridley is offering uh, a chocolate biscuit bar in, in paper format. Uh, the paper-based pack will be introduced as part of a collaboration with German retail partner, Adika. Uh, which will be available in more than 500 outlets. Um, the confectionery market is experimenting with paper-based solutions as part of a wider shift, really, um, in making plastic reduced environmental improvements. It's still um, small experiments at this stage, so uh, the next um, 
example is, is one that is, is changing things, and we'll come on to that in a moment, uh, of a big rollout. Um, but this example is, is, is more than 90% of the packaging is made from paper and sees a reduction in the use of uh, plastic packaging by around 440 kilograms for a 100,000 multi-pack. Multi um, the new packaging system needed to deliver in terms of maintaining product taste and quality as well as protecting it from contamination and moisture. Um, the packaging developed for Mars is more than 90% natural fibers um, and is FSC uh, certified. Uh, a thin barrier coating protects the chocolate um, and lessons learned from this pilot will feed into future design of the packaging as the business looks to roll out more products uh, in, in paper-based uh, formats in the future. Now, I mentioned that most of these were uh, sort of small ex experiments, but this is an example of something that's going uh, the, the whole way. So uh, we announced last year that Nestle were uh, working or introducing a uh, recyclable paper packaging for uh, a couple of their Smarties variants, and they're now going the whole hog and, and introducing um, uh, introducing um, a new paper-based rollout for, for the whole of the range. Uh, the ship will see the remaining 90% of their range switch to uh, the recyclable paper packaging. Um, the switch of the brand, um, which was launched way back in 1937, did you know that, uh, will remove uh, approximately 250 million plastic packs uh, sold worldwide annually. Um, and it is across all their uh, packs, so the sharing bags, multi-packs, and the, even the giant Dexa tubes. Um, so that's a, a, a significant change from a, from a market leader. Uh, Deer Smith um, are, are also part of this. I mean, they've um, benefited a lot from recent e-commerce growth in, in the market and uh, stories of uh, corrugated packaging being um, in short supply. Uh, but in this case, they're incorporating its green coach technology to deliver an alternative to styrofoam for cooler boxes. It has helped Brewer uh, Box uh, deliver a first commercialization of their cooler alternative. Deer Smith um, worked with uh, VigPack to develop uh, this solution. The patented 100% uh, recyclable biodegradable cooler uses Deer Smith's proprietary green coat corrugated moisture resistance and FDA food contact safe material as an alternative to styrofoam. Uh, green coat is biodegradable and made of a renewable fiber that reduces waste to landfills and carbon emissions. Uh, the box is shipped uh, as well as displayed as, as well as is displayed flat, so that significantly more stock can be utilized in a much smaller overall space. Last slide, last innovation before we hear from Justin. So um, this is uh, looking at sort of new uh, recycling infrastructures and how sort of smart and intelligent packaging is, is starting to infiltrate in, in, in this space. So here we have Unilever working with um, Chinese uh, e-commerce company Alabama, Alabama uh, to launch uh, AI enabled machines to improve packaging recycling rates. The creation of a new system of recycling machines uses artificial intelligence to automatically identify and sort plastic packaging. Uh, the Waste Free World initiative is the first of its kind and helps to speed up the recycling process. There has been 20 of these new recycling machines installed in various offices and community areas in the Chinese states uh, of Shanghai. And there are plans for up to 500 of the deposit machines to be placed into the market in due course with the aim to cover, recover 500 tons of high grade plastic back into a closed loop recycling system. Consumers are incentivized to participate with various Unilever coupons, as well as Alipay rewards um, uh, all they need to do is scan a QR code on the packaging before depositing it, depositing it into the machine. The AI technology identifies the type of plastic and sorts it. So now over to Justin. I'm going to try and um, can you share your screen, Justin? Uh, yes, it says it will stop your other screen sharing. Yeah, per perfect. Um, that's fine. That's great. So I'll continue. Excellent. Oh, 
Are you able to share your screen now? Uh, yes. I've stopped, I've stopped, I've, sorry, I've stopped, shared, I've stopped sharing mine, so that should yeah. allow you to, uh, to share. Over to you, Justin. Yeah, I think I have. Have you got it on your screen? Uh, you should have it on your screen. Not yet. No, it says it's failed. Apologies. It worked perfectly in rehearsal. It always works perfectly in rehearsal. This is one of Zoom's little uh, foibles that it, it always seems to. Um, alternatively, I've got your presentation, which we could share, but uh, obviously I'd need to move each slide on. Uh, let's just see if it's letting me. That should. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So just one second, it should pop up as a slideshow. There we are, hopefully. So, Paul, just confirm you've got that on your screen. For I have, Justin. Thank you very much. I look forward to um, hearing more about your wealth of experience in the industry and how you're uh, changing things from a, a plastic recycling point of view. Over to you, Justin. Well, hopefully what, what, what I'm going to share today is, is hopefully about how we can drive recycling rates up. Um, you know, Char Pack as a business, um, we, from 2018 onwards, we decided that sustainability was going to be the key. Um, and, you know, our strap line became, you know, serious about sustainability. And it's not just a strap line, it's what we actually do. So I've, I spend a long time, a lot of time um, trying to either help char pack be more sustainable or see how we can improve recycling rates. So what I wanted to do today was share some background on um, PET, what's happening with PET, what's happening with clear PET in the future. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of info at the front end of this. So this is taken from the recoup annual report that came out at the back end of next year. It's 74 pages long. Hopefully I've distilled some of it that um, is good information for everybody. So 2.2 um, million tonnes, that's what we place on the market. And there's 1.2 million tonnes being declared as recycled from all sectors. That actually means collected. And I do bang on about this point and people who know me will know that's so that's the collection uh, number, which means it's sort of 49% of everything we put onto the market is actually collected there's then only a proportion of that that's recycled. Um, so, you know, when, when you've got um, suppliers saying to you, um, we can do 100% recycled content, um, and re the reality of that is we can't, none of us can really do it, you, you know, where are we going to get the product from? So, you know, it, it's, it's a, a bit of a warning there. Please don't go all down the line of uh, trying to get 100% recycled content because you're not going to get it. Unless we recycle that 2.2 million tonnes, you're never going to get to 100% everywhere. Um, and it's a bit like the vaccines at the moment. Share it about equitably. So what's the challenge coming with Clear, PR, clear RPET? Um, so... Post-consumer recyclers generally consist of 67% bottle strap and 33% of pots, tubs, trays. We've got DRS that will be coming down the line. Um, and DRS could potentially, um, in its current form, the Scottish form, it could potentially pull a lot of proportion, you know, a high proportion of the bottles away from post-consumer recycler available to train manufacturer. And obviously. I'm a tray manufacturer, so I need to know that I've got good source of clear our pets and, uh, you know, and, and as, the, as the figure states, 67% of it at the moment comes from um, bottles. Um, so we've all got this target of 30% post-consumer recycled content. Implications for bottles being pulled away from um, from tray manufacturers is that we're going to struggle to find the post-consumer recycler to hit that 30% target. So the implications of that is that the market, um, and it's all market driven, is if there's a dearth of post-consumer recyclers out there, guess what's going to happen to the price? 
Um, so we need to do something about that. We need to do something about driving up um, the household collection and then the recycling of that household collection. So one approach is the one that I'm in, that Charpak are in partnership with Unilever, uh, we, which we're delighted about because we, we are very closely aligned on our sustainability targets, as Paul mentioned earlier on. Um, so the, 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 part, the, the collaboration with Charpak, Unilever and Veolia is about exploring new streams of feedstock that aren't currently available. So that includes non-food grade bottles. Um, that's going to be, and obviously that will be outside of the uh, deposit return scheme. We've got significant funding from the UK government through UKRI. It's a three year program. Um, and Veolia estimate that 32,000 tonnes of non-food grade bottles along with pots, tubs, trays. This is the vital part of that. There are, this is, we're trying to create a tray to tray recycling scheme globally. So, so, you, well, so certainly England wide, um, that we can, we, we're trying to reuse more of the pots, tubs and trays that currently either get downcycled, burnt, so for any energy, energy, uh, energy usage or shipped abroad. Um, and obviously shipped abroad. If it's not shipped abroad, then we're preventing ocean plastics, aren't we? If, if it's not put on the water in the first place. So this is what Charpak, this is the Charpak challenge. The Charpak element of this is how can we take that new stream and incorporate it into direct food contact? There's some commercial confidentiality about the process um, but what we're aiming to do, and again, it's a theoretical currently, it's a three year program to get this to market, is can we take a combination of non-food grade bottles plus pots, tubs, trays? There's a proportion of multi-layer um, trays in there as well. How clear can we get it? Can we make it safe for direct food contact? That's our challenge. Um, the cleaning process is where the confidentiality comes in. But essentially, we're trying to then make that safe for direct food contact. And, and obviously, it's going to be fully certified before we place it on the market. But it's a valuable stream of feedstock that isn't going to go back into bottles, into, isn't going to go back into um, um, food grade bottles, which is fantastic news for the tray industry. So I said Charpak serious about sustainability. I also said that um, we need to find other ways of making sure we up the recycling rates. Um, and so I talk about coloured our pet as well. So what happens at the moment is coloured our pet is produced from clear our pet. And you take clear our pet, which will include bottle scrap and post-industrial recycler, and you put a load of master batch in it to create a colour. So you take a high value clear bottle on a small percentage of trays to create a colour and that they used to get recycled, they would go into black. <clears throat> but the market said, no, we don't want black because we can't find it and which means we can't recycle it. Um, it is, as everybody probably hopefully in the room knows, black is technically recyclable. It's the finding of it's the problem. So every colour that goes onto the market tends to get downcycled. And again, that's either downcycled into strapping um, or burnt, so energy from waste, um, which to me is a waste of that resource. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about reuse, recycle, then you know, if we can't reuse it, then it needs to be recycled rather than burnt. So we've got an opportunity. So, Paul mentioned the UK Plastics Pact. There's an action group to look at jazz PET tray to tray recycling, create the business case for it. Um, so, a, a collaboration. So, that's retailers, manufacturers, waste contractors, and reprocessors. We have to collaborate across the whole industry because there's about 20,000 ton, tons of this per year gets, as I said, downcycled, burnt, shipped abroad. Um, and we need to create the market for it. Um, and that's what Charpak are doing. We've done this, we've, we've created this product called Satchmo and we're basically saying jazz is the new black. 
So what Charpak have done, we've created a set of colors. We're, we're limited to colors at the moment, but we're constantly expanding those. But we create it by reusing the colored jazz flake. Um, however, the difference between what Charpak and, uh, has done and everybody else's, we've cut, uh, compared to everybody else's, we've covered up what's inside it. So we've got a set of consistent colors and it stays consistent. It's also allowed us to reduce the amount of master batch, the net 1% master batch content. It is detectable. Um, we test every color before we put it on the market to make sure it is detectable. It's fully recyclable. It contains 86% of recycled material. And it's, it makes your product sing on the shelf. I'll just, uh, just show you a couple of concepts we've worked up. If you just take olives, for example, and I noticed Nick is in the room. I just name checked Nikki Grange, she's seen this. Um, so it, that, that goes on the shelf, but look what it would look like in a nice olive green that's made from 86 recycled, 86% of recycled content. 50% of that is post-consumer recycle it. It looks fantastic. So we add value, it, we give you shelf, stand out on shelf, and the, with the addition, it's, it's very, very sustainable. There's a lot of stuff out there, we just need to make sure we reuse it. They are in store, you'll have seen them in various other retailers. Um, you'll have seen um, the suit, this is specifically the Tesco Sushi. So the bases on that, which traditionally would have been black, um, we've now got a, it's a grey blue colour. If you go and look at that, that looks fantastic. Um, it's, it's, uh, and it's from the jazz material. Jazz material makes that and it's the same colour every time we, every time we produce it. And that is a 10 minute that should have been 15. Um, and I've obviously spoken too fast. Is the end of my little piece. Uh, hopefully I've given you a taster and uh, you know as Paul said there is the breakout room later and if you if you've got more questions on it um, then please come into the breakout room and talk to me. Thank you very much Justin I'm just um, you keep talking whilst I try and get my screen up. Okay. Um, uh, that, that was very very interesting you did some fantastic work there um, we'll take some questions um, I noticed there's lots of chats, and, and so there's lots of chats. Um, so I don't know if you, while you're doing that, do you want me to answer some of these that relate to what I've just spoken about, or is this going to be for the breakout? Uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that at, at the end with the, with the, with the Q and A. Okay. That's okay. Um, and then we can do, do all that in one go. So, um, can you confirm? Oh, uh, hang on. Um, you can't see my screen yet. This this happened before. Um, I've definitely come out. Yeah. Yeah, we've got you up now. Right, brilliant. Thank you. I did, I did a presentation once where I, I knowingly didn't have the screen showing, so I presented to a, to a blank screen for 20 minutes, so I don't want to do that again. Right, so as I said, with the breakout room, just email paul at thepackhub.com at the end of this webinar and we'll reconvene uh, in, a, in a breakout room where you have opportunities to speak to Justin on more of a one-to-one -one level. Uh, but without further ado, we'll crack on with the remaining recyclable packaging innovations um, part of this webinar. So um, there's been a lot of activity with, with paper bottles um, uh, over the last six to 12 months. Um, and uh, um, you know, and, and a quite an emotive subject as well. People got very strong opinions uh, about the virtues uh, or otherwise of, of this this move. Um, certainly, when 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 companies can support what they're doing with evidence from an LCA point of view, uh, it certainly helps the, their case in, in terms of this being the um, the right thing to do. I mean, bearing in mind that moving to paper bottles from uh, glass, which is uh, obviously infinitely recyclable. Um, there are other 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 um, subject, other sustainability 
objectives being um, catered for here. So what we have here is um, the world's first gin brand packed in a paper-based bottle, and it's set to go on sale in the UK. Um, we had a real sort of early nod to, to this, so um, so early indeed that um, there are no images of the, um, the, the gin bottle uh, available yet, but it will be launched uh, soon. Um, and it's been created by uh, Frugal Pack, uh, who you may have seen before with, with some of their paper-based initiatives. Uh, and they're behind the change that sees a predominantly uh, recycled paperboard with a, a food grade liner um, that is you know, poised to potentially shake up the, the spirit sector. Um, they've partnered with uh, Surrey-based Silent Pool Distillers to produce um, the world's first commercial gin in a paper bottle. Uh, the new bottles can be recycled alongside household waste uh, as an alternative to glass bottles, obviously, uh, that have a higher carbon footprint. Uh, the bottle is five times lighter than a glass bottle equivalent, so obvious knock-on carbon footprint uh, improvements there, uh, and it's claimed to be uh, six times 84% uh, lower carbon footprint. Uh, and Bruegel Pack did some research um, that showed that almost two thirds of UK wine drinkers would buy their product in a paper bottle if they had a choice. So if uh, consumers don't always say, don't always end up doing what they say they're gonna do in research. Um, but in this case, that would be very promising um, that the, the idea of a paper-based uh, beverage bottle has um, strong uh, um, appeal, uh, certainly in the UK market. But the new product is based uh, on bagging box wines. Uh, so there is a, there is a plastic um, element inside, which would be, is separated from recycling. Um, Frugal Pack is also working on, on other orders uh, for paper-based beverage containers, the spirits in Japan, whiskey in the US, and wine in Spain, Australia, Italy, and France. So watch this space. Uh, Frugal Pack are certainly doing a lot of interesting work in this, in this area. Uh, next up, uh, we have H&M um, Group uh, that have made an announcement to move to paper-based uh, packaging. Um, fashion labels are, are under increasing pressure from stakeholders to reduce the environment, environmental impact of their activities, uh, particularly around packaging and that the growth of the e-commerce market makes it all, all the more visible. Um, so the Swedish fast food, fast food, fast fashion retailer, H&M Group, is one such organization that has announced that it is seeking uh, to reduce uh, its packaging by a quarter as part of their drive to uh, deliver, you guessed it, reusable, recyclable, or compostable packaging by 2025. Um, they have pledged to only source recycled, rather sustainably sourced raw materials by 2030. So it's still got uh, nearly 10 years to achieve that goal. Uh, the retailer has introduced a new system incorporating paper packaging to help reduce the use of plastic throughout its supply chain. Um, the paper replaces the outer layer of plastic on delivery packages. Um, the retailer has commenced testing of the new packaging in distribution, distribution centers of, uh, across various European markets, as well as China, Russia, and Australia for its various uh, labels. Another uh, carrier system, so this is from Atlantic Packaging, uh, responding to the changing demands for beverage can collation systems, um, we've tracked several of these uh, over the last sort of nine to 12 months. Um, and it, as it seems, the beverage market is, is migrating en masse from plastic to paper based collation systems. Uh, we're also seeing you know, a move to a, a no uh, uh, collations, in, in other words, multi packs that um, do not need collating and you, and you get the, the discount at the, at the point of sale. I know that um, Waitrose are on this call, uh, have, have, been, um, have been working on that for a few months now. Um, so the new solution uh, is done with, in conjunction with fishbone packaging and has been designed to carry beverage cans and will replace the plastic ring uh, handle. Uh, curbside recycling, uh, recyclable product is biodegradable and has been robustly performance tested. Uh, the paper-based can carriers are, are made using less material compared to full overwrap paperboard cartons um, and available in both four pack and six pack formats, uh, as you can see. Another one for Mars Food, um, working with, um, with Amcor 
uh, to bring the first food safe monomaterial microwave rice pouch to market. Uh, breakthrough in packaging technology, we'll see pouches of Ben's original and see to change brands re uh, recyclable where the infrastructure exists. So this is what I said right at the beginning that uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of chicken and the egg. Uh, recyclable pouches and various other packs are being introduced. But we don't necessarily have uh, the, the sort of the polypropylene infrastructure to uh, recycle them at the moment, but um, you can't do one without the other. So uh, Mars Van Poor have introduced this new solution. The recyclable uh, solution will be uh, the industry's first food safe monomaterial microwave rice pouch. Um, and it delivers in terms of shelf life, functionality and safety standards as you would uh, expect. And um, this is uh, a uh, looking at recycled expanded polystyrene, uh, um, which is a new, new development from uh, German protective packaging specialist Storopack. Um, and it's made entirely from post consumer EPS waste. Um, the, uh, but both the recycling and the production of REPS, as it's now called, is carried out in the company's own facilities. Uh, and Storopack is currently working with a, a consumer electronics retailer uh, whose customers can return their used EPS protective packaging once they have received their products. 100% um, R EPS promises an improved carbon footprint, although they don't go into too much detail about what that, what that manifests in. Um, yeah, so that's a, another development. Um, and the, the business has a, an objective to increase um, the amount of renewable and recycled materials in their supply chain by a further 50% by 2025. Here we have FFP packaging solutions who have helped uh, a free from plant-based foods brand Gosh Food launch a new range of plant-based snack bites in 100% recyclable packaging. Um, the Gosh Food came to FFP with an objective for their packaging to be recycled in current waste streams to match the brand's environmental ethos. Um, the, the barrier requirements lead to the introduction of an all PE laminate that can be recycled alongside carrier bags at larger uh, UK supermarkets. So although they're saying it's recyclable, um, it has the capacity to be recycled, consumers still need to be motivated enough to take the uh, used product and the used packaging to, to their supermarket for recycling. And just two more now. Um, this is a post, uh, post consumer recyclers in food packaging have tended to be used for uh, mechanically recycled our pets so far, and we've covered lots of examples in our innovation zone. Unilever is trying to break new ground for their, their NOR brand by creating packaging made from recycled polypropylene from chemical recycling processes. A pilot project has been instigated to see grainer packaging, Sabic, chemical company Sabic and Unilever combined to create uh, food packaging containing polypropylene from post-consumer waste. The new packaging includes for the first time the tub and lid made from 100% certified circular uh, polypropylene made from post-consumer plastic. Uh, the polypropylene has been selected from Sabic's tricircle range which uses mixed post-consumer plastic as its raw material. Uh, the plastic is broken down uh, to the molecular level through high heat in an oxygen free atmosphere, creating uh, an oil. Um, Grainer packaging is also working with mechanically recycled polystyrene in some initial testing. So they're uh, really going for it there. Um, German, Germany headquartered styrene uh, producer Ineos Styrolution has agreed uh, to progress a joint development uh, with Canada-based Polystyvert um, aims to create a circular economy for polystyrene. This is fresh uh, news. We, we literally posted this on our innovation zone the, this morning. Um, so single-use polystyrene has a long packaging history of delivering protective insulation for food and medicine products, but, uh, but of course it's, uh, it's good functional attributes are undermined by the fact that it's uh, difficult to recycle and it's not uh, biodegradable. Um, so they've developed a, a patented dissolution uh, technology 
to recycle the post-consumer uh, polystyrene uh, waste. Uh, the method takes plastic waste in solid form and dissolves it into a solvent. The process can separate hard to remove contaminants and additives before separating the polymer from the solvent. The final product is a cleaned polymer to be used as a raw material resin again. Uh, the purification technology opens up the potential to treat feedstock from, through from industrial waste through to post-consumer. And the recycled polystyrene pellets can be used to manufacture various new uh, polystyrene products, including for food grade applications. Uh, the last one here is from uh, Avery Dennison, uh, who are leaders in adhesive technologies and packaging materials, and have been doing lots of good work uh, in the sustainability space in recent months. Uh, they've announced that they've introduced the first commercially available direct thermal labor pa paper label containing recycled FSC certified post-consumer waste. The recycled direct thermal or RDT solution, as they called it, is a BPA-free direct thermal uncoated paper that contains post-consumer recycled waste. The introduction of RDT has been created to meet the demand for more sustainable labels, obviously. Uh, the functional performance of the solution is said to be on the level with standard DT paper in terms of visual appearance, printability, and barcode readability. Avery Dennison is planning to continue to expand their recycled label portfolio uh, while striving to maximize the recycled content percentages uh, of the materials. Uh, direct thermal paper has become a popular material due to its easy use and high print speeds, etc. So uh, that's an interesting development, um, really demonstrating that recyclability uh, it really affects all, all materials um, and, and all formats, really, including labels as well as other packaging formats. Okay, so they're the packaging innovations. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Barrington onto the call. And if Justin, if you could um, unmute yourself as well. Yeah. You there, Barry? Yeah. Oh, but perfect, I couldn't see. Right, um, so have, have you got some questions for Justin, please? Well, um, I think Justin had picked up, there's quite a few on the chat. I don't know if you want to pick out the ones that um, you can respond to there, Justin, and a lot of them came through on the chat rather than the questions and answers. Yeah, I mean, what I'll do is I'll come down to the ones that relate to me, if that's all right. Um, yeah. What I did want to say was it was really interesting, a lot of Paul's, you know, your innovations. But I mentioned in my presentation collaboration. And the reason I talk about collaboration all the time is because a lot of those innovations are really going to rely on the infrastructure to get those to be able to recycle, especially the last one, thermal paper with re post-consumer recycler in it. Where's it coming from? H how are we gonna get it? And that's what I, mean, that's what I talk about on, in, in collaboration. We have to include the collectors, the recyclers, the reprocessors in all of our, everything we're doing, otherwise we're just putting on something onto market that doesn't actually get recycled because there's no infrastructure for it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a ranter about that because if we can't get hold of it, we can't reuse it. Um, right, so Katie Pepper, um, where is the 33% pots, tubs, trays for, coming from? That's from household collection. So that's curbside collection. Um, Charpak did a, a circle of life project. So all of um, Cambridge's curbside collected um, clear PET comes back to Charpak. It gets reprocessed and then comes back into Charpak and we reuse it. Um, that's where the 6733 comes from. Um, you know, we, you, you've got to do some extrapolation, but we have very, very good data that says within Cambridgeshire, so that's Cambridge City, Peterborough City, and the whole of and any of the other town in Cambridgeshire, they have to, and, and all local authorities have to do it, they have to say where does your, what, what's your recycler made up of? So we've got very good data that proves it's 70, 30, 67, 33, around those sort of figures all the time. Um, Ian Cooper, yes. <laughs> How about stopping exports of PET post-consumer recycle that could be used in the UK? That's what we're trying to do. Um, yes, the second, your second part, coex virgin food grades with non-food grades 
um, was viable process in the late, late 90s. Yeah, that's part of our process. You've got to be very careful with non-food grade and especially with direct food contact because non-food grade may well have had, you know, um, perfumed products um, and that's where the issues arise. I can't put food contact material out there that still smells of, um, I was going to say Lynx Af Africa, but I quite like that, but you're not going to want that wrapping your chicken, are you? Um, so there is, there are commercial and um, technical elements to overcoming using non-food grades. Um, so Patrick, um, getting a direct food contact is a snapshot test. The, the, right, so obviously, I mean, I talked about commercial confidentiality. In order to get this to market, there's going to be a lot of tests done and trials done. Um, and the, it's the process that it's going through that will get it to um, where we need it to be. Um, Linda Greener, uh, why not ban black completely? Um, I don't think that's the answer. It was never the answer, Linda. Um, I think from a consumer point of view, if you ask them about um, sustainability and environmental and, and um, recycling, yes, they want to get rid of black. Is the you know, but the food industry certainly um, everybody piled into black because it was the cheapest product out there. Why was the cheapest product out there? Because it has. The most recycled content it always has had the most recycled content so actually jazz is the new black is the better solution than just banning black completely um david smith cost implications for my product um it's at worst cost neutral um I, but i want to make a profit <laughs> so so you get where i'm coming from um, Nikki, thanks. Yes, I know you're a fan of Satchmo. It's a, it's a really good one. Um, Andy, thanks for that. Um, Douglas um, says that are your tray supply preformed? Yes, I do. Um, but you, it depends on who you're from and whether I'm whether you want to buy the material. So um, talk to me in the breakout room or contact me after. Um, Paper-based bottle, um, and then I think that's that's it um, for me um, because then it go. It, obviously, I stopped talking, and then it went on to um, Rob Holman asking stuff, Barry. So if you want to yep. see where I am on the chat, yeah, just one thing, um, Justin. We're seeing the effect of the changing world with COVID on on paper recycling rates, and and now a bit of a crisis with recycled board do you see uh, any potential changes on the horizon with with sort of plastic recycling with with the changes in the sort of the market at the moment um well so the, I, I mean, we're always going to get this you know um you know at the start of covid you know bottom fell out of the oil price plastics got a lot cheaper last year they're going back up this year because of force measure and other things and then we've got the the stories of corrugated etc price rises and, and it will always be cyclical that it that may well push currently it could push um product into plastic because plastic it, you know could potentially be cheaper my own view on the future of, of certainly with um plastics in my area i.e um rigid thermoforms um my interest is in driving the sustainability of the plastic. So, in, you know, I think that post COVID, more of us working from home, the legislation coming down of what will and won't, won't be collected by local, local authorities, that's going to make a massive difference. You know, we need every single local authority in the country collecting pots, tubs, trays, and plastics of all descriptions, because that's back to the infrastructure topic. So, I actually think until there is viable alternatives, and I'm a proponent of compostables, I'm a proponent of proper biodegradables. However, 
I still come back to there is currently no infrastructure to deal with it. Until we have that infrastructure, we should stick with what we've got and make it sustainable. You know, it's not it's not rocket science. You know, it, we could make everything in the world compostable, home compostable, great. And three percent of the UK population have a home composting. So you cre you're creating something that only three percent of the UK population can home compost. So what's the point? There is no point because it won't get composted. So, you know, things like that, it, it, it's, so I actually see plastics coming back up the agenda because of what it does for um, prevention of food waste and all of that, plus the implications of if we continue to get shortages of carton board, cardboard, corrugated, and which pushes the market price up. And for whatever reason that is, that is going to help. And the same, exactly the same as when plastic prices go up. Don't know whether that's answered the question, Barry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's just interesting to get people's views who are closer into markets about how the world may change again over the next year or so in terms of supply and demand and, and the effects it's having. Uh, you know, a year ago, we wouldn't have predicted any of the things that have happened in the last year. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect we, in a year's time, will look back over this year and go, wow, what happened there? But I suspect it will continue to have an effect on on packaging and people's views about various types of packaging and packaging formats as actually the world of retail is going to change again and will continue to change. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, the major retailers, you know, have all done well. Um, and we appear to be going back to either, it's either, um, you know, click and collect, home delivery obviously, um, has gone up massively but so has in-store purchases and, and we're doing more more single trips so basket sizes have gone up you know uh, you know and, and certainly you know I should think um the old you know the the, the single use plastics i.e plastic cutlery and takeaway containers I think they've probably dropped um because of hospitality um closing down um you know but but the upside you know, for, so the up, so the downside from that is the upside for the retailers. Um, <coughs> you know, and and uh, you know, as a consequence of that, um, it has sort of concentrated the mind of if we're going to put stuff in plastic. You know, every single retailer will tell you the same thing: the more sustainable and the more recycled content we can get in there, the better. And then that's back to my original thing: infrastructure. We have to collect the stuff in order to recycle it. Yeah, and I think there's been a number of questions really touching on that with some of the innovations that Paul's put forward is, is does the infrastructure exist mm. um, for some of these waste streams and yeah, are, they, yeah. are they getting a bit too niche? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I always have a view that, you know, keep it simple and it's it's more likely to have some, some success. Just on that, Paul, there's sort of a, a group of questions really. I'm sort of conscious of time reflecting on greenwashing and are some of these innovations really uh, what they, they seem and it's probably a good time just to remind people that you put forward the innovations but we're not making a really a statement as to whether we think they're good bad and we we let people draw their own conclusions on that and yes some of them are, are potentially greenwashing or, or very much into sort of niche segmentation of of, of what is is going on um some particular questions all around the the paper gin bottle but i think your comment was it's very early days and we haven't really seen any real detail on that is that correct uh there's there's plenty of detail in terms of sort of carbon footprint reduction claims uh, and the like um but this specific execution there's there's, there's no imagery uh, available yet I've, I've, I've checked with Google pack um so it's it's still very much early days in terms of that actual specific execution although to be fair, anyone that's interested in to find out more, if you look at um, the Frugal Packs website, they've got a lot of information on there about what they're doing and, and why they're doing it. Yeah. I think that probably is covered in the majority of the questions or comments that we've seen. Um, let me just check. I've been on the, uh, the chat rather than the, the Q&A page. I think there's a couple more through have come through on the Q&A. Yeah, Charlotte. Um, how do you foresee Satchmo products re-entering the closed loop recycling system? Well, um, all of the cards we've produced are 
um, fully detectable. And so we'll go into what is currently mixed coloured plastics that's collected anyway. Um, more than 85% of UK local authorities collect mixed coloured PET. And that's how it ends up back in, um, in into the system. And so I'm expecting to see on um, bale stuff, the, the more widely the Satchmo Jazz product gets out there, the more likely you are to see that coming back through the system. And there's one final question come through about how will HMRC police the recycled content um, declarations after the April 22? Um, that's really a question for HMRC, I think. Um, that's not for us to worry about. That's for them really. Um, quite how they'll do that it will be interesting to see um, I, I, and it will gradually can unfold. I, can I comment on that? Um, I've, I, because I've had three or four one-to-one um, -one sessions with HMRC about this, about the taxation. Um, so I did a lot of work with HMRC and they, um, and, and more on RPP, Rob, um, it was, you know, they are going to inspect um, and they will be checking traceability. So we've got to be careful on traceability to ensure that traceability is actually up to date because otherwise if they do come and inspect you and they are intending to, um, they will be looking for traceability. So you can't, you can't fool them um, or, or fudge the issue. They're going to want to see full traceability on it from, from cradle to grave and, and especially on RPP. Um, because that's, you know, that's, you know, obviously most, a lot of this, especially if you're an extruder producer, um, it is open to abuse and they are aware of that. Hopefully that's answered, Rob. Okay. okay. Um, Paul, I think that's probably, yeah. we're about on time. So that's probably okay. the end Perfect. of that section. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Justin, for your excellent answers to uh, quite a lot of questions. That's really encouraging. Um, one minute from me, so just to inform everyone of our next webinar, which will be on Tuesday the 16th of February, uh, 3 o'clock GMT. Um, we'll be looking at Packaging Insight and, and the latest consumer research on packaging functionality from Centra Tapes.